My guest today is Richard McCann. He is a Times number one best-selling author and has now written four books. His first sold close to half a million copies and is translated into 11 languages. He's the founder of the ICANN Academy and has worked with organizations across the globe for the last 15 years, sharing his personal story of resilience. He's also an award-winning speaker and fellow of the Professional Speaking Association and in 2019 was awarded the PSAE, the Professional Speaking Award for Excellence. And I think I was there that night when you won it. Welcome to the show, Richard. How are you doing today? I'm doing well. I'm doing well. We're preparing for an event this weekend, but the calm before the storm. Good, good. So because the show is called Unbroken, the first question I ask every guest is what does the word unbroken mean to you? That may be that calm before the storm, before mm -hmm. something happens. And I know there are a few people from time to time that go through life without any experiences of being broken in some way, uh, but, but there aren't many by the time they get to the end of that journey. So I think unbroken is maybe that period before you're exposed uh, to that, 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 that challenge, that setback on adversity. Mm -hmm. And I guess our journey is really going back to that place of when we felt unbroken before any of the stuff happened to us. So we're really going to start at the beginning with you when you were just a five-year-old little boy. Um, can you tell us what happened to your mum? Yeah, um, but before I do it, I was just thinking then, was, was I unbroken before the, the incident we're going to talk about? And yeah, I think I think I was. Well, we had a really really tough time, not far from here actually, uh, in, on a Leeds council estate. You know, poverty, uh, you know, violence, drugs, alcohol, all that chaos was going on. Um, but a week before my sixth birthday, you know, I, I was that was the, the day I was subjected to that the adversity that we've been alluding to when mum went out drinking and we never saw her again. Uh, tragically, she met Peter Sutcliffe on her way home who gave her a lift and, and there's no easy way of saying this she lost her life at his hands uh, 50 yards from the family home and I suppose that is one of the reasons or, or the was missing and you went looking for her I wasn't quite sure much detail to go into but I, mean, I didn't think she was missing I just thought that oh she's not come home mm -hmm. I didn't think we was never going to see her again we, we wandered the streets we sat at the bus stop hoping believing she's well she'll, she'll come over one of the buses not working out as a little five-year-old boy that actually it's 5 30 in the morning there's a good chance she isn't going to come home on this bus uh, but little did we I, I didn't i don't even think i knew that murder was a thing at that age so you know later when we ended up going to the children's home and we were told that she'd gone to heaven and that we weren't going to be seeing her again i i still didn't understand that she'd been murdered. Uh, what nobody had any idea is that this was the start of, you know, five years of, you know, pro probably the darkest years uh, that the north of England would go through for some time. Absolutely. It's, I can't remember when I actually worked out that she'd been killed by another person. I, I don't remember when that was, uh, but pr pretty early on, you know, maybe, maybe six or seven when he went on to kill more women uh, and then I realised, gosh, right, okay, that was him. Uh, and because my mum was the first, she always got mentioned and it just seemed to follow us around as young children. You know, after mum died, went to a children's home and then we were brought up by my father. You know, and losing a parent's hard enough, having a parent murdered's hard enough, yeah. but then having, it, having her murdered by a serial killer, which would, you know, be this massive new story which meant it was in the public eye uh, you know, so often just just meant it was like a double blow uh, for, the, for that for the well say that those young children that we were back then in answer to your question what does forgiveness mean to me it's not for the other person this is my view it is not for the other person although that would might be a nice thing to do it's for me it's for the person that's been wronged to let go, to, to free themselves of, of, of the anger that um, they quite, quite rightly have, you know, 
can feel, but uh, it's just not doesn't serve us. Doesn't yeah. serve us. Uh, so I let it. I let it go. I let it go. Totally, my definition, and I think of the word forgiving. It's for giving me a better chance in life and for giving me peace in my life and for giving me happiness and for giving me myself back. So, yeah, it's, uh, it's interesting to hear everybody's different opinions. And we did meet in the Forgiveness Project and I sent you my a copy of my book because you very kindly offered to send it to your publishers. And originally my book was going to be called 44 Bows. And when you heard there was this number 44, you kind of had this flip out, which nobody had had this strange reaction to the number 44. But the number 44 is not just magical to me, it's magical to you as well, isn't it? It is. I, I have always loved the number 44 or even triple four, even better. But me and my sister were fascinated by 44. We saw it everywhere. And it wasn't until I looked into this that Mum died on the 30th of October, mm -hmm. which is week 44. Even more profound is that her killer, Peter Sutcliffe, and you can research this, he went home to his mother-in-law's house where he was living at the time, which was number 44 Tantum Prison. You know, uh, by the way, by, by a complete coincidence, last night I went to bed, I was watching something on Facebook. I, it was just something recommended. It was some crime thing. Uh, I, I, I do like to watch those kind of things and I was woken up and at, let's say at one o'clock in the morning I must send you this afterwards by the way mm -hmm. by the police interview interviewer saying to this potential um what do you call it I don't know the culprit and so the the, the vehicle was uh, stolen at 4 44 in the morning wow I, I mean did I just I'm, I'm semi-conscious I went I, I must I must have a look at see where that occurred I'll go back and check that in the morning uh, and, and I'll, I'll send it to you Fours, forty fours, triple fours. It just has this kind of spiritual, comforting thing. I wondered how you felt when Sutcliffe passed away. I know he had COVID and he refused to get any treatment, and he passed away a year or two ago. What did that do to you? Well, when he um, uh, immediately passed away, and I was given the news by my son, mm -hmm. it was it was a shock. It was a shock that the see. I know that he did me wrong, understatement, but he's, he's, been, he's been there, he's been part of my life for 40 odd years. Like this, almost this, this I don't know, this scoundrel of an uncle that you know gets drunk at parties. He's just always been there. So for him to go, it was this real strange dynamic. I mean, the day that he actually died, I was consumed and uh, you know swamped by media interviews. So I actually didn't get time to process it but um, but the following day, when I woke up, and, well, first of all, so I didn't celebrate the fact that he'd gone. There was no anger. It was just this strange dynamic. But the following morning, and I woke up for the first time, and I thought, oh, gosh, he's no longer on the planet. I don't know. The, the sun shone a little bit brighter. The birds seemed to be a little bit, you know, sweeter. Is that the right word? You know, uh, it, it was just strange that he was no longer here and I didn't realize that while everyone was alive even though I'd forgiven him and let go of the anger there was just this awareness that the perpetrator was still around you know was in the news very often and and do you know what he's gone now I was very aware when he passed away that I wanted to remember the names of the women rather than the names of him and I I have the names here and if that's okay with you I would like to read out their names so Wilma McCann Emily Jackson Irene Richardson Patricia Atkinson, Jane MacDonald, Jean Jordan, Yvonne Pearson, Helen Ritka, Vera Millward, Josephine Whitaker, Barbara Leach, Marguerite Walls, and Jacqueline Hill. It's actually quite emotional reading those names out. Before we finish up here, do you have any last words that you'd like to say or some advice for anyone that's listening that, that's really struggling finding their way through whatever they're experiencing right now? You know, you've been through your fair share of uh, challenges, Madeline. And at the time, it's really difficult to, to comprehend that I'll be able to uh, recover from this, uh, bounce back from this, uh, maybe even grow from this. But the truth is, there is a way back. There's always a way back. Um, you're not on your own. There's always someone there to support you. Don't keep things to yourself. I did that. Mm -hmm. I kept thinking to piece together. <laughs> Uh, myself uh, in a way that I probably should have done years earlier. So I guess 
that, that, that's my, my final parting thoughts. Um, everything's going to be okay. And life may never be the same again after whatever we go through, but there is a life for us. Absolutely. I think it's a brilliant, brilliant piece of advice. There is always a way back. So it just leaves me to thank you so much, Richard, for coming on the show. And uh, yeah, thanks a lot. Thank you, Madeline.